Warning, this is not a podcast for those who have got it together. We are men seeking answers to the questions that have plagued our mind. Can we be undefeated? Anyway, thank you so much, Anita. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to me. It's been a long time. Yeah, We've uh, been friends, been I figured it out, 25 years. Really? Yeah, I started working at Prairie House Living Center. That's where we met. Uh, my very yeah. first nursing home job. Um, yeah, I, in 1998, that's when I started. Wow. So, been 25 years. So, you and I worked together. Well, time flies. At, uh, huh? Time flies. Yeah, it really does. Anyway, you and I worked together there. And it was. It was I always say that I grew up in that. I'm not loving this feedback. Anyway, uh, I always said that I grew up in that nursing home because I worked there, I think, six, seven years. And uh, yeah. that's how I got started. started in dietary manager. You were, what, MDS or you just charge nursing? Hey, man, I'm sure um, you did it all. I did, actually. <laughs> uh, I was in, I think I was one of the nurse managers at the time. Yeah. I, I really, I did so many different things. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like me. I, I remember, believe it or not, one time I was over activities, one time I was over maintenance, and one time I was over, uh, I ended up like the CFO and then the administrator eventually. But uh, good times. It's it's amazing to me how many people I still know from that time period, you know, that yeah. I'm still connected to on Facebook and whatever. I haven't talked to anybody in a long time from there, yeah. but... It's still amazing that those connections are still there. I drove by there. When did I drive there? Last week. And I just, you know, I, I, almost every time I go through Plainview, I kind of look at there and check it out. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I've, I drove by there, I don't know, a few years back. But, oh. yeah, I think, you know, I think we all bonded there because we went through so much together. Yeah. You know. There's a lot of truth to that. It's kind of funny because I always tell the story. I don't, I'm sure you remember it, but at that place, you know, everybody said basically they were struggling financially. It was a nonprofit organization and uh, they struggled and struggled to make money, but then they got auctioned off because they basically, I guess it was filed bankruptcy. I guess that was the best way to say it. I don't know, but they filed yeah. bankruptcy, I guess. And we're auctioned in public auction, and they auctioned off for, I believe, ten million dollars. Does that sound right? I think that's Gosh, right. I don't remember. I don't Something know that like I ever that. knew how much. So I think it was ten million. And it always, I always used that story because it's like a company that was pretty smart decided they were worth quite a bit of money, and yet we at the time didn't see our own worth. I guess, it's, and I think it's a, it's a great analogy for a lot of things that you don't really see your worth when you're in the muck or the like you yeah. know in the middle of it in the forest of the trees or whatever but that place was actually you know very valuable the size of the facility the fact that it had a home health the fact that it had a hospice and it's pretty a nurse pretty, aid school don't forget about yeah, that yeah yeah for sure. <laughs> That's I, I I've actually used that a lot too in the past I've said you know cuz I don't know how many nurse aid training schools I've been a part of. And I'm like, yeah, that's where I, first time I was a part of one was back then. So, yeah. And then you and I worked together for a little bit on a on nursing home that I owned. And that I was very grateful that I got to work with you then. Um, so it's been, what are you doing nowadays? I work at a nursing home here in Lampasas. Lampasas. That's by Austin. Or where is yes. that by? It's it's about an hour away from Austin. Okay. Close to uh, Clean Fort Hood. Okay, Clean, yeah. It may be closer to San Antonio, right? Um no, it's actually closer to Clean. No. Um, San Antonio is about two hours away. Hmm. I uh I probably told you this before, but I actually went to school and grew up for a time period outside of Austin in Smithfield, Texas. Oh, it's really? where the movie Hope Float was filmed. Oh, well, that's so, cool. Anyway, but I didn't know that. Yeah, I uh, went some elementary school and I went to junior high there. Yep, yeah. and then I moved to the Dallas area. 
Well, how are, so what are you, are you doing like charge nurse in the nursing home now? Yeah. Yeah, I was with a, I was a marketer and a, a field nurse for a home health here. And uh, I went to work at this uh, nursing home. So yeah. I actually, <laughs> this is bizarre. The administrator there I worked with several years ago in San Antonio. Okay. And I didn't even know he was here until I was out marketing uh, one day and I went into that nursing home and, and there he was. <laughs> it was it was really strange to see him here. Mm -hmm. So so just a little background. You're an LVN, right? Licensed vocational nurse. They don't call yes. them that here in Oklahoma. But For 30 years. Can you believe that? Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. And so w w how would you describe your career feel like where you're at now? Do you feel like you've gone like back or do you feel like you're, I mean, tell me where you feel like career wise you're at right now. I would really like to get out of nursing and I've been wanting to do that for, for quite some time because it, uh, you get burned out on it. Yeah. Um, it, you, you just get tired and exhausted, you know, in, in many different ways, not necessarily physically, but, mm -hmm. um, I've just had a difficult time knowing because I've done this for so long, knowing what, what I want to do, you know, what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> it really amazes me. I think it's a great subject though. It really amazes me how many times we want to start over in our life career wise, or we do start over. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I can relate to that because, you know, I was in nursing home, that industry for 24, 25 years and what, you know, everything from running multiple facilities to owning a couple and man, my last kind of gig, I just got so burned out on it. You know, I, yeah. I really, and even though I have it like a, and I know you do too, like a love for the elderly and I think I'm really good at it. You know, I think that's something I've always been really good at, but just kind of burned out on it. It was, you know, I don't know exactly why, but, you know, part of it, I was talking to somebody about this. It's like, you know, we have a heart in order to be in that industry that long in healthcare or especially long term care. You have to have a heart for caring for people. You really do. You, mm -hmm. And and the problem is, is that you quit working in that industry and you go do something else. Um, nothing really, it's going to, you're going to have a hard time comparing those two. You're going to have a hard time feeling fulfilled like you do in that business. Right. And, you know, like for me with real estate, I do see the value in it. I mean, people buy, need to buy houses and people need a place to live and they want to have a, their forever home and all these things. But still, if I try to compare the two in my mind, like, okay, what I used to do with, you know, nursing homes and now what I... It's hard. It's hard for me to compare those two because, you know, you're really yeah. in the business of helping people and and it does, you know, and it, it doesn't feel as important as it did at one time. Yeah, I, I think um, in in long term care, I think there are a lot of changes that need to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things that hopefully will come down the pike. The way it's set up now, it's just not working. It's too impersonal. It, it's difficult to describe because when you really do care about people and you want what's best for them, uh, because they honestly are at the end of their life, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's difficult when it's really kind of like you're just ha warehousing them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like for what I realized is that, and I hate it, but it really does come down to money. And it's because yeah. you have a home that, you know, most of these nursing homes, you can't build a brand new nursing home very easily. It's one of the toughest things to do. And there's multiple yeah. reasons why that, but it really comes down to regulations and cost because uh, they only allow so many, you know, beds in a county or in mm -hmm. a certain area. And so to build a new one, you'd have to close down another one, which that's not that big a problem. I think that Oklahoma closes a couple hundred or something a year. I mean, th there's a lot that close. But the problem is, is also meeting the regulations when you build the new one. And so it really does come down to money, because if you 
you know, a nursing home can't afford to have just an abundance of staff. It, it's just, there's right. no way. And the ones that are able to do that are ones that are more private pay. And the problem with those is that it can't meet the needs of most of the community. You know, most of the people right. cannot afford to pay private. So it puts us in this place. So you have these very creative people. I think you're one of them. I'd like to say that I'm one of them. And you have these creative people who are really trying to, within these very limited resources, trying to make these people's lives the best they can make them. And I, I think about all the creative things that I did. And I did a bunch. And I know you did a bunch. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it comes down to, uh, you know, you are kind of spinning your wheels because, you know, you take, I always used to talk about this, about how it's like, you know, that these nursing homes are patterned right after the hospital, which is a very institutional type care. And yet we wanted to change that, but you, it's very difficult to even change the look of it. Yeah, you can put some paint in the walls. You can do better decorations. But the truth is, it still looks like a hospital. <laughs> you know, it still looks well, like what you're trying to. Mentioned institutional. It's more like if you've ever been in a prison of, of work, you've San Marcos at the, at the jail there, it's, it's almost prison, prison-like, honestly. Yeah. yeah no, and it really it's is. not home-like as much as you know nursing homes want to do the home-like environment it's not yeah um you know when you have a nurse's station and then the hallways you know extending out from that that's that's not that's not home-like yeah um, well I always use that example that's like you know that's how I started in the business I was a I was a dietary manager basically ran the kitchen and you know in the in the industry, they call it a certified dietary manager because you got to go to school and yeah. get your certification. But the tra same training program that trains the the uh, managers of prison kitchens is the same training program for the managers of nursing home kitchens. And most people don't realize that. So when I went to that school, I was actually in class with dietary managers of prisons too. So we were all in the same class. I don't know if that's, it's changed so much. Now it's so much online and, and all that. But when I went, it took like a year. It was a year long program and you went, you know, a couple of days a week. And But you went, I, I'll use that as an example because they were training both. They were training us to run kitchens and nursing homes and they're training, you know, the prison uh, dietary manager do the same thing in, in, in confines of a prison. And where they related, especially at the time, and maybe even now, it's they're related by money. It's like you only have yeah. so many funds to feed these people. And I used to find that just so, uh, it just, it kind of broke my heart that, you know, that's what we're talking about. It's like we're we're comparing it to what we do in a prison or vice versa yeah. on how to feed people. When we know from just hearing that prison food is probably some of the worst food. So, but, <laughs> you know, I, and I think about all the creativity that I did with dietary and trying to make it more home-like and restaurant style. And, and really, I came down to the conclusion that, <clears throat> you know, I kind of missed the boat because I always thought multiple choices were the best, give them all kinds of choices. And then looking back, I kind of wonder if minimal choices, but doing really good would have been better. So who knows? That, that's kind yeah, of if, with with the older population, you really give them two choices. You know, you, you minimize the choices because it because of the aging of the brain, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. And difficult yeah. for them to make decisions. Well, they end up choosing the same things over and over again. And, you know, well, so I, I learned either. lessons from doing those. <laughs> I don't know how many restaurant style dining that I started and and I would say it was about half and half on success. So I look yeah. at a lot of things that I did do and I don't know that it was really that successful, honestly. Um, you know, lots of trying, but I'm not sure that it ever and I think it's the environment. It's kind of back to what you were talking about. It's the environment it's that industry is very tough and I think you can do your very best to make an impact. You know, I figured it out for me personally was making an impact into like individually that was more, again, impactful because like, for example, I could come and I could impact somebody's life today way more than 
the programs and all the stuff that I was trying to put in place, you know, by me doing simple acts like playing dominoes with them every day, those things made a bigger impact than, you know, the initiatives of changing it into restaurant style dining or the initiatives of, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many different initiatives, like Eden Alternative was a big one that I was just, you know, which is a culture kind of, you know, uh, change and and I think about all the work that I put into that and you know and and I look at the most successful you know facilities that do that or the homes that do that and they're they're really successful at it they're the brand new ones you know they're the ones that mm-hmm. and 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 it's not just that it has to be the mentality plus you know yes the building is important because you you have these were smaller environments and they're built for those it's you know those things were a lot more chance of success than trying to do it in you know the old school nursing home that's you know i was yeah. trying to make big changes within inside the you know the skeleton of an institution and it was just very difficult very difficult yeah and you add on top of that just the mentality of the staff that work there and and it's not you know I'm not speaking against them but people get things ingrained in them about the way things should be and yeah. just because I've learned this about my own life just because you recognize the need for change doesn't mean everybody else does or that they're going to be on board with that yeah uh, i mean people it definitely in general takes don't a like lot. change yeah I agree with that. It takes a time. It takes a lot of work to change. And, you know, unfortunately, it's like in your case, being a charge nurse, you can affect your shift. I think very positively, kind of what I was talking yeah. about. You can bring a certain mentality to the shift, but you're limited in what you can do. Whenever I was an owner, like the sky was the limit. You know, I could really try to do anything I wanted to do. But right. it was I was still limited by money, you know, honestly, I was limited on how much resources I could do. And that, you know, mm-hmm. that was one of the problems with or one of the struggles with being an owner is that you uh, you only have so many resources, you know, where you, sometimes if you work for a bigger company, they have a lot more resources, but they may not buy into the whole idea of the change in culture. And, you know, so. Right. But I still think culture yeah. matters. And it matters a ton, you know, the culture of the of the building and the the home. I, I think, uh, you know, one thing watching you, how you would play dominoes or just sit and talk with the the residents. No. I think that's one of the most important things uh, because they miss connection. Yeah. Uh, and um, relationships, you know, they don't get that there. You know, their families might come visit or whatever, but that's. That's not, you know, that's an intermittent thing. Mm -hmm. And so they want real connection. I just, you know, sometimes I take the time to sit down and share some of the pictures I've taken of the the little lambs that we have here with some of the residents and they love it. Yeah. You know, just taking 10 minutes with them and talking personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, it's that personal connection that they miss and feeling, having purpose. Yeah. There, there's nothing their hope and their purpose is not there mm-hmm. yeah. and it's hard to give that to them when you have to work on a schedule uh you know i'm nurses are very schedule oriented because we have to pass meds at a certain time you know you you have to be careful not to go over that time uh because of regulations you know, mm-hmm. it's it's very regimented and time oriented yeah. and you have to be careful not to to go over that. And so trying to squeeze in actually being personal and with them is it's difficult. And that's the frustrating part is because you see them suffering mentally and emotionally. Mm-hmm. And that is the f- most frustrating thing for me is to watch that and not have the ability to sit and really be with them like they need it. Yeah. I see that. I really do. And I, you know, I listen to my daughters who are in nursing school right now. And of course they don't want to work with the elderly. They want to do, you know, newer, fancier things. But I, uh, I see that even their struggle, it's like when it comes to 
patient care, it's like they only have so much time. They only have so, yeah. you know, they have so many patients and that's in training. So I can't, you know, I can imagine and I've seen it my whole career where, you know, you have one nurse trying to do it all and it's very yeah. difficult. So I see the frustration in them and the, like they want to, you know, nursing school doesn't, it just gives you the very basic. And, you know, most people don't realize that you don't come out of nursing school, like knowing how to do it all. You have to really be trained after the fact that yeah, they honestly do. learn enough to pass their test. And that's kind of the extent of that. You know, yeah. even though they're doing clinicals, the whole point of the clinicals is to, because they don't even really get to do it. They get to watch a lot. I'd say 80% of the time they're watching, they're not doing. And so then they're kind of thrown right. out there. If they work for a good company, then really they train them for how many ever months or however long. But if they don't work for a good company, they're just kind of thrown in there. I think about brand new nurses who started working at the nursing home that I was a part of. And I'm like, man, we did not set them up for success because there's no way, you know, that's pretty overwhelming. Oh, guess what? You're the charge nurse now and you just graduated nursing school because <laughs> you don't yeah. know how to do all those things, even though theory, you know how to do them, but you have not practiced all those things that, you know, that you do even in a nursing home. So, Well, I had um, my first job out of nursing school. I worked at a nursing home in Plainview. It was a different one uh, by the hospital. IHS. Yes. And I don't um, even think IHS is in business anymore. It was, a, it was a nightmare. I just, you know, I was, I, I was always thinking, what did I get myself into? Yeah. Um, because I was alone with sometimes with 60 patients on one side of the building yeah. because we were so short staffed and it was just, it was terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And so I ended up, I've worked there a few months and I ended up going to the hospital working night shift for two and a half years. And that is where I learned how to apply every things that I learned in school. And I really think that a lot of nurses need to work. If you're fresh out of school, working in a hospital is where you're going to get your most experience, not just on how to do, uh, you know, the technical things and assessments, Mm -hmm. Really being able to apply what you learn about disease process uh, and how to recognize, you know, if somebody's in AFib or CHF or whatever, yeah. uh, how to recognize those things. And then you can take those skills with you to nursing homes or home health or wherever uh, when you're kind of left on your own and you really have to take the initiative uh, to apply your nursing skills. Yeah. It really helps to work in a hospital. Yeah, I agree with that. And I know that just from having knowing enough nurses to that work, you know, that's a tough environment too. You know, they're both tough environments. It's like, you know, I've seen a friend of mine work in med surge here. And, you know, same thing. It's the patient ratio to in, the, in that case, if they didn't have a CNA that day, you know, she's doing everything. She's, you know, Right. taking them to the bathroom, changing them, you know, doing it all. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, where I see my daughter is getting the most amount of like what I would say clinical and experiences when they're going to a bigger area like Oklahoma City and they're working at the big hospitals there. Uh, yeah. I feel like they are getting a lot more of that, you know, what, you know, that, they overuse the word, but it's like the critical thinking. It's like what you were talking about, noticing the signs of, uh, you know, a possible stroke or noticing the signs of heart failure or notice, you know, and I think that they're going to see, and it's, it's just volume. You know, if you think about it, it's just sheer volume. If you're working like the ICU or you're working the emergency room, you're going to, you know, you work in Elk City where I live, you're not going to get the volume, you know, and I think that that volume is pretty, you know, important when you're learning. It's like you yeah. get to see a ton of it. And I think that's like most n new nurses, you know, reason for not wanting to work in a nursing home. They feel like that they can't keep learn new skills. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I get their point. It's because, you know, you don't have the volume of. Right. these particular issues coming in. So anyway, let's talk about a little bit about, uh, you know, you, I, I, I do, I'll apologize on fr up front about this because you and I have had uh, many discussions about 
I wouldn't say many, but we we had a good discussion about God, spirituality, and you know, <laughs> and and I've actually ch- changed my concept a little bit since that conversation. Not that I changed completely, but you know, part of it is, um, you know, I don't think that I gave you enough uh, probably credit for or really listened and and about what you had to say about it and you know, me being stubborn or whatever, I'm sure that's part of it. But (laughs) I really, you know, I I know that you have, I would like to hear about it. I know that you've looked into like Judaism and you like Uh Hebrew. And I was just curious where your journey is in that. And uh, I'd just love to hear what's going on with that, your spirituality side that you're kind of seeking and looking and things that you've done. Yeah, it's, Honestly, it's kind of difficult being in a rural, can't say that word, uh, area because there's not a synagogue around. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is an actual Messianic synagogue about an hour away. Uh, But that's that's where when I lived in San Antonio, I was I would go to synagogue and it's really called it's more or less a house of learning. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I started going there is because I started realizing the Jewishness of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to know more. I wanted mm-hmm. to see it from a Jewish perspective. It was amazing when I started realizing how Jewish the New Testament is. And I don't mm-hmm. know, that might be a funny, odd statement to make. Yeah. Um, but when you start studying Judaism, it really opens your eyes to a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, learning Hebrew language, uh, the meanings of the the Hebrew letters, it's very in-depth. Um, and it, it, I just find it fascinating. Hebrew, uh, Israel history. I, I like old world history anyway, but um, it, I think it, the study of that helps you apply it in everyday life, just how you deal with circumstances in life. And, and I'm nowhere near perfect, Mm -hmm. but I feel like it makes me maybe a little calmer sometimes and kind of just sit back and contemplate before I react sometimes, not always, (laughs) but I would like my study to be more in depth. It's just, I'm not around any place of learning. And it's really mm-hmm. hard right now to apply that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm I'm real question. curious what made you kind of go that direction and what, uh, you know, it's definitely different than most people here. And especially in American Christianity, you know, in the Bible Belt that, you know, we live in. So I'm just curious what you, you obviously found something lacking with what you had, you know, maybe have you know, the experience you had. So I'm curious about your experience and why, why you chose to kind of look that direction. And my mom, I would sit and I would watch my mom. She did a lot of biblical study when I was a kid. She always had her concordance out and always studying the the Hebrew language. And when I was in my late teens and early twenties, she started going to synagogue and she was, she became a Messianic Jew. Mm-hmm. And I uh, started observing the Saturday Sabbath and the the holy days, Pesach, uh, Hanukkah, Yom Kippur, you know, all these, the different Jewish holidays that Jesus actually observed in the New Testament. Um, yeah. And so she, she had started her own Torah study group in Plainview when she and I uh, lived together. I at the time wasn't interested in that. I was in my twenties and I was off doing my own thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I would hear her speak on that, just different things at, at the time. But I, I got more interested in it really the last several years, um, doing just biblical study. I just felt like I needed a spiritual reworking or a spiritual change because I started Mm -hmm. seeing the world in a different way on a more spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's so much in the Bible from front to back that that applies today. 
And it's, you know, I can read a scripture and I can think, oh, that's what that really means. Because it, it either, you know, has come up in recent past um, on how to deal with certain things. And it just, it became more applicable to me. And it's not just a book of history, but a book of now mm-hmm. uh, on how to apply life to it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. I mean, and just for clarification, because people, I mean, I'm sure they're curious that, that are listening, but, you know, from what I understand, there's there's two groups of, like, they're basically what you're talking about. One group would say that the Messiah hadn't come yet, and the other would say Jesus is the Messiah, but still the traditions of you know, of Judaism and and all that. So which camp do you feel like you fall into and why do you fall into that camp? Well, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, he was a Jew Mm -hmm. and he, he did not do away with Torah. He, he lived it. He showed the example of how to be Torah. The, and when I say Torah, uh, it's, you know, the first five books of the Bible and, and really honestly beyond, but, you know, he said he did not come to do away with the Torah, Mm -hmm. uh, but to fulfill it, to fulfill something means to show the, show how to live it, to, um, it live it by example. And even Mm -hmm. in, I think it's John 10, Mm -hmm. he observed Hanukkah. You know, which is technically not in the Bible. It's in the book of Maccabees. Right. Um, I I just wanted to see the New Testament through Jewish eyes. And Mm -hmm. I think it's important. It's really, it gives it more depth when you observe the Jewish holidays of Passover and Yom Kippur and Hanukkah and all these things. And and I'm not, as far as that observance, I'm not where I want to be. Because again, it, Judaism is very much a, a group oriented kind of thing and it's a community. And I just, I don't have that here mm-hmm. and I miss it a lot uh, yeah. because it, it's just, it's so deep and it's so, it's so spiritual. And I, I just, I think that you really can't understand the depth of scripture until you observe those holy days. Yeah. And I don't know, that's just, that's like, I also, in my studies about the history of Christianity, there was a lot of things um, that along the way were changed, uh, and and there's a lot of paganism. And I, I don't want to be offensive to anybody. Uh, that's not my intention. But that's what I found in my studies was mm-hmm. a lot of paganism that has made its way back into Christianity. Yeah. And it, Christianity is not what it was originally was or intended mm-hmm. to be yeah and you know i know that in the new testament it talks about you know the point is not to convert people to judaism that's not the thing i, th- I think that's an axe but you know everybody is on their own spiritual journey we all have to work out our our path with fear and trembling you know yeah. <laughs> right. and uh that's that's my path I like it. I think that, you know, the probably the biggest change I would, you know, it's not that I agree or disagree with what you're saying. I am more interested may now than maybe I was in the past. And part of the interest is I'm interested in things that change people's lives and that, you know, that I think that where in the past I felt like the you hear this a lot. You hear this from preachers and people teaching, and and what you hear is that the the road to God is very narrow, and that there's only really one way to God. And what I've come to believe is that there's a broader path than that. I think there's almost like a broad highway. It's like God makes it very easy to find Him, um, but you got to find Him. You know, you want to you got to want to find Him. And the word that I like probably currently is willingness. You got to be willing to find them. And, you know, like you take a scripture, like seek and you shall find. I think that we make that sound complicated, but I don't think it's very complicated. I think that it's seek. And I think that what you're doing is what you're, is you're seeking, you're looking, you know, and, and I think that, you know, one of the problems I've had with Christianity as a whole is 
that we have a tendency to just, you know, I, I don't want to judge people when I say this, but I feel like that we are just like robots sometimes and we just literally do whatever somebody tells us. Like our Bible knowledge or our spiritual knowledge or whatever, it, or religious, it just comes from really a very surface level. And it's because we believe exactly what we've been taught. And we get that from a third party, which is humans, and that are fallible. And they, you know, they're not, they're not expert. I mean, they may be experts in human sense, but, you know, it's like we're getting it third party, you know, and I think that the struggle is, is that we don't build our own knowledge. We don't find out for ourselves. We depend on other right. people to teach us. But it comes back to whether I agree with you or not is really not as important as I think the seeking part. I think the seeking part is really what's important. I think that you are seeking, you know, what you feel is important and I think that that can be very life changing. And I, I think that whatever, it's almost like what works, go for it, you know, and Christians don't like to talk about that, especially American Christians. They don't like to, you know, I think there's many paths to God. And, uh, I, and that's something that I've really changed my mind on. I, and it's not that I was very dogmatic in the past. It's just about this particular subject, but I just feel like that in my journey that there is, that God, if if let's say you couldn't read, let's say you can't read the Bible at all, or let's say because you can't read, and there are people in this world who can't read, and right. you know, and maybe you don't have a Bible, and maybe or maybe somebody give you a Bible but you can't read it. You know, there's all kinds of circumstances. I believe that if you're on an island by yourself, you would find God if you wanted to, and it's you know the Bible talks about it. you look up, you see the stars, you look up, you see. The yeah. beautiful scenery you look at, and yeah. and I think that we, uh, especially me, I've made that too complicated. I think that in those very simple terms, God wants well, people to seek Him, and I think that He's He will allow them to seek Him in many different ways, and it could be just through the stars, or just through scenery, or just through a personal relationship that they find God. Well, it's like. You know, when I'm outside and I'm just walking around, you know, either I'm around the animals or flowers or whatever, I can see him more in that and in scripture than just going to church. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, um, absolutely. I don't, you, first of all, you can't contain God in a building He's yeah. everywhere because he created everything. And, mm. you know, I asked my mom several years ago, what about the people that don't have access to religion or church or to a Bible? You know, how does God, how do they know God? Mm -hmm. And and she told me that God knows their heart. He knows where, where they are because he made them. Yeah. And so, yeah, they may not have, a, you know, things available to them, but, but he reveals himself, himself to people in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, he he revealed himself, different aspects of himself to them uh, in, on an individual basis uh, because mm -hmm. he understood their individuality and what yeah. they were capable of. You know, with Moses, Moses was so unsure of himself and thought he was so incapable, but God made him capable. No. And, you know, he he can make all of us capable. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, I agree with you. I think that I'm on, I, I keep using this story, but I think it's a great um, I think it's a great story in the Bible that points to the character of God and uh, and how wide and you know the ability is to find Him, and that's the thief on the cross. You know, I've used that story multiple times here lately, mm -hmm. but the thief on the cross didn't have to believe in this and that and this and that. He literally just asked Jesus to remember him in his kingdom. And Jesus said, I, you'll be in my kingdom. You know, right. that's Burl's paraphrase. But the point is, is that that's how simple it was, you know. And then you look at yeah. verses that talk about, you know, being, we need to have faith like a child and very, you know, very childlike. And I think that 
we have very we've complicated it to the point where people are struggling to find God. And because they don't know, you know, where to find it. And they feel like, you know, I always give the example that if you listen to Christian radio or which I mean, every town, every area has a Christian station that's playing right now. And it could be Christian music and it could be, you know, somebody preaching or you can turn on the Christian you know, uh, religious channel on TV, and that's going on 24 hours a day. But depending on which program, you can get all kinds of information and it all, none of it matches, none of it's the same, none of it, you know, and so I see why people are very confused by, and then they have a bad experience maybe at growing up and how, you know, when I was growing up, I went to a very legalistic church. And so that definitely groomed or, you know, it, impacted me on what I believe for a long time. And then you go maybe to another, you know, I went to a very grace oriented church for many years and that also impacts it, you know, and you start to realize that all these other outside influences are, are impacting you. And for me, all it ended up doing was complicating it. You know, it just complicated it more and more and more partly, you know, and then I even got to this boat where I was, you know, very, I wouldn't say critical, but yes, kind of, where I was kind of critical about maybe what other people believed if I did, it, it didn't align with what I believed. And, you know, I think that's the opposite of what God wants. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've been that way too. And I've, I've learned and I am learning to just sit back and listen and, and try not to talk so much yeah. uh, or argue. One thing that really struck me as something really profound is when I was going to synagogue in San Antonio, we would have like study groups or or specific subjects we would study on uh, that would have classes in the evening. You know, just people, different people talking about their perspective about God or or their own ideas. And they were accepting of it. You know, there, there was a, when she was talking about she had struggled with her belief in God mm-hmm. and if he even existed because of the things that she had been through. No one, I ne- I did not feel judgment from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very understanding when you struggle spiritually yeah, or when you question <laughs> spiritually, but their, their approach to answering you is very different than what you would get in Christianity because they want you to seek it out and they want you to search it. And they're not, there are not easy answers in Judaism. Mm -hmm. You don't just get a quick answer. You have to find it. And uh, they know that God will give you the answer if it's meant for you to have the answer. Mm -hmm. And that part was frustrating for me. And it took me time to learn that because, you know, I was used to quick answers or easy answers or being spoon spoon fed the information. And it's mm-hmm. not like that. You know, you have to you have to seek it out and find it for yourself. And there's been many times I've had so many questions, you know, that even pop up in my head. And God always shows me the answer in scripture. He always gives me the answer. It may mm-hmm. not be right then, but maybe a few days later. But he mm-hmm. always gives me the answer. Mm-hmm. Um you know, one question I have right now, something that dawned on me the other day, was if Jesus' death was required in order to f- for forgiveness of sins, why was he able to forgive sins prior to his death? Why mm-hmm. was he able to absolve people and, and find forgiveness and grace before he died? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you asking or just... <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I can tell you my opinion on it, but, and I think I, I mean, this is what I believe on that subject. And I don't know, it makes sense to me that because you have Jesus who is basically eternal, no beginning and no end. Um, in other words, he's always been around. He always will be around. And so even though he came to this earth for a certain amount of time, but if I could draw, draw, draw a graph, I think that it's, a, he basically went all the way back to the beginning of human time and all the way forward to the end of human time. Another question, yeah. you, this has actually puzzled me as a young Christian. It's the opposite of what you're saying, but it's the same concept, which is 
wait a minute, Jesus died, you know, at zero date, you know, in other words, at this point in time on the cross. And here I was born in 1972. And, you know, the way that I was taught was, hey, you know, you're you are building up the sins until you become a Christian. And then he's forgiving. Let's say I've become a Christian at 14 years old. So now he's going back and forgiving the sins for 14 years, um, even though he died, you know, 2000 years ago. And so that really starts to complicate it. You're like, wait a minute. And the way, you know, uh, what I think the answer to all that is the simple is that his is a forgiveness that literally surpasses time. It's as it yeah. surpasses the all it's the way back to Adam <laughs> Wait. and all yeah. the way forward to, you know, the last human being that's going to live on this earth, you know. And I think that's the only thing that I can to me that makes sense. And the the other reason I like that is because I believe it's a perfect forgiveness. You know, yeah. it's something that he could see me that I was going to be born in 1972 and knew that. I was going to, you know, that I was important to him and, you know, he wanted to make sure he died for me too, if that makes any sense. So I'll tell you well, a, a funny can, side note. I can see your prescriptions on your glasses. You can what? I can see your prescription on your glasses. It looks like something. It's funny because there's like numbers on your glasses, which they Are say, you you, yeah, that you can see your prescription on your, but anyway, That's pretty bizarre. interesting. So, it, but they say, down. I, it's t- too small. I need my glasses in order to see them. <laughs> anyway, right? Well, they do. Like, I don't know if that's completely your prescription on your glasses, but I see something numbers. Uh, but it's funny because they say that they're imprinted on your glasses, but you can't see them because it's like outside your vision, you know. That's but bizarre. I didn't know that. Well, and I'm like I said, it may be just a reflection or something. But anyway. Well, I think it's, you know, I I think that, you know, what I'm real curious about, and this is why um, I wanted to have you on anyway, is because, you know, I think that the importance of this is like that you found something that helps you, you know, that you, that helps you seek and that makes you interested in seeking God. And, and I mean, that's really what it comes down to is that you're seeking God. And I think that's what it's all about. And, you know, part of it is like, people don't know you, you know, and I know you, I've known you for a long time. And I do consider you, of course, a friend, and a a good friend. And, you know, there's not very many friendships that you can have for that many years. I mean, I can't count, I can count on one hand, how many friends that I literally talk to at this moment that we've been friends as long as you and I've, you know, known each other. You know, it's real hard in an hour program or whatever to bring out all of, you know, because you're a little bit older than I am. And I'm only uh, two years older. <laughs> that's a little bit older than me. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard to bring out all of the the stuff that's happened in your life, you know. And, and part of it is that I want people to understand that you have a person that has had some very ups and downs and has struggles. and Life hasn't Mm -hmm. been, it hasn't turned out exactly the way you want it. And I know that because I've talked to you, you know, and I know you, and I know that you've had your struggles and just like everybody else. But I think that those struggles have led you to the point you're at right now. And that's really important because if we don't understand that, like the person behind the voice and what they believe and what they're thinking and what they're seeking, if we don't understand, that they have a story. That's probably one of my biggest things is that, you know, I, I teach, I, I, I preach this at, you know, in long-term care is that there's no way you can actually impact these people's lives. I'm talking about the elderly people we work with or the staff, if you don't know their story, because right. if you don't know their story, then it's real hard. It, things change when you know somebody's story, you know, if, if, if they realize that you have a story and they hear that story, then it deepens that connection. It deepens that relationship. You know, and I think what society does most of the time is that we wear these masks and we don't want people to see 
um, the true us, or they don't. We don't want people to see the intimate parts of us, the parts of us that we're maybe ashamed of, or embarrassed about, or right. you know, that's hurtful and painful. But that's who has made you who you are today, you know, and and that has yeah. impacted what you believe too. It truly has. I mean, you, at, you know, back to circling around to kind of you know our initial talk, our initial question, which is why? Why do you believe these things? And it comes down to that, you know, what you were seeking was not answering, was not, you know, providing the answers you wanted. So you kept seeking more, you know, and you kept mm-hmm. trying to find more. And, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not, um, it sounds like it sometimes that I'm down on the church and all that. I'm not. I went to church yesterday. But, um I do see a big lacking, and it's because uh, it's human. When you, the church, the building, as you mentioned earlier, is, it's lacking. You know, it's just, it's a, it's proven. It's lacking, you know, yeah. and I don't blame it all on the building or all on the preacher or all. I think that it's just, it, it's, you know, again, fallible. It's, it's, it's human. It's humans make mistakes and humans aren't perfect. And, you know, and I think that what, the good thing about, you know, the church and the the way it is, is that it causes us, it should cause us to seek more, to want to know more. Why is this not working for me? Why is this, not, you know, that's kind of what, mm-hmm. you know, I've been that way where I want to know why, what works for me, what's not working for me, what is impacting my life, what is not impacting my life, you know? So, well, and it, I think the main thing within religion and churches is, I think, seeking God through relationships with each other and understanding each other is more important than a building or activities or, you know, all these external things going on is, is truly developing a relationship with each other and, and understanding each other because it's, it's important to, to do that, to be able to function and work together to, to make the rest of it successful. Mm, yeah, I think that's for sure. It really, if it comes down to, I think you're exactly right that, that if you if we look at it from a relational standpoint, you know, in other words, the relationship with God, that's relational, the relationship with other people, that's relational, you know, we say the greatest of things, you know, is love. Well, that's relational. It's, you know, it's the world is polluted, something simple as love. You know, we are uh, the message that I would that they talked about at church yesterday was sex and how, you know, the world has polluted sex. You know, they polluted. Yeah, they you know, I think that you're right, that it really becomes relational. And that what that what does that relationship mean and how does it impact your life and how do you impact others life? You know, for me, I, I yeah. keep talking about this as well. It's like one thing that. I've compl- it's almost robotic, but I've completely changed like my prayer life and the fact that what I do is only pray for other people. And I'm I, and again, very robotic, meaning that that's not the way I'm used to praying. It's not like I was just praying for myself, but I could be praying for like my situation or finances or whatever. I've switched that around to where I really am only praying for other people. And I'm leaving my personal stuff that I am concerned about. I'm I'm basically leaving that in God's hands. And I'm praying and concentrating on other people. And you know who I concentrate the most on? People that I have resentments for, toward, honestly. Yeah. And of that's course, I pray for my to kids. Do, and that, that's hard to do, but we're well, supposed and, and, to do that. You know, and that's something that I've learned lately. It's like those resentments will kill you. And, and here's. Uh, again, another way to say resentments, resentments is thinking about something over and over again in your head, replaying it, replaying what happened, replaying. And those can turn into resentments, like so-and-so did this to me. Mm-hmm. And what I realize is that I can take what is basically pray for them, that they get exactly what I want, that they find happiness, that they find fulfillment, that they find what they're seeking. and sounds so simple, but I think that that's really how God designed it, is that He wants us to be concerned about other people. He wants us to be concerned about 
you know, and yeah. those people that have hurt us or we feel like that there is, you know, that they've done us wrong, that we were wanting the best for them, you know, just like I think God wants the best for them. Well, and, you know, uh, God in the Old Testament, uh, you know, he would he was upset because the concern for the widow and the orphan mm-hmm. wasn't there, you know, and he he truly cares about his creation he also wants us to care about each other you know um and i think that's what it boils down to is we're so we get so wrapped up and and concerned about superficial and i'm not saying that that you know some external things you know they are important but at the end of the day it's the relationships uh that are most important in our relationship Mm -hmm. with god yeah for sure well how do I know you're not huge on social media? I know you're on it, but um, how do people, if they want to connect with you and you know they want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? I guess you know I never really even thought about that. <laughs> well, one may one easy way. I mean, obviously, you don't want to throw out your number to everybody here on on the on uh, social media, but part of it's maybe your email, and that way they can reach out to you and then have a conversation and maybe they want to ask questions about some of the stuff you talked about. So let's start there. What's your email? Anita.fields08 at yahoo.com. Anita.fields.08 at yahoo.com. Anita.fields. Oh, Anita.fields. 08 at yahoo.com. Got it. Well, Anita, I appreciate you taking the time to be on here and uh, I have a lot of respect for you and very appreciative to, of our friendship. And it just means a lot that you to, took the time to, to be on here and talk. And so I, well, I hope thank you, you for inviting me. And, and I have to say you're one of the few friends I've had and probably the reason why we've been friends for so long, even though we didn't always stay connected uh, for that length of time was because I can feel feel like I'm on. I can feel like I can be honest with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. The same. And you listen. So I try. Sometimes I don't, but we'll not go there. <laughs> no. yeah, all right. We well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, right. I will talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, bro. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Positively Undefeated. If there was something in this show that resonated with you, please share the show with your community. If you want this show delivered each Monday morning to your podcast app of choice, please subscribe or follow. And if you'd like to get a hold of Burl, please do so by going to BurlStricker.com forward slash contact.